tie. And Cliff here, he's tying flies for us. Looks pretty intense there, Cliff. Tell us a bit about tying flies. Oh, it's very intense at times. And what are you trying to tie right now? Um, I'm just doing a classic. Uh -huh. I don't know yet what, which one. And what do you tie mostly for? Any, any, uh... Freshwater mostly, uh, trout, salmon, uh -huh. steelhead, a little bit of bass. I guess it pretty, pretty well depends on the lake as to what you use, eh? Uh, not so much that, but it's the time of year and what happens to be available at that time of year. Okay. And uh, early in the spring, after ice off, the first instinct to emerge is the coronament. So the fish will start to get a little more active as the water moves up, warms up, and they'll uh, get the, take the coronaments. Coronaments are very abundant, too. So. They don't have to work too hard to get them. Uh, dragonflies and damselflies are available all year. Yeah. Damselfly nymph is a four-year cycle. Or certain damselflies, or sorry, dragonflies can be uh, in the nymphal stage up to four years in the water, so they're available for that whole time. But in the wintertime, when the water gets really cold, trout tend to get lethargic as they're cold-blooded and don't really seek out food too much. As soon as the ice out comes off, then they'll move up onto the shoals and uh, take their fish or take their feed. So, so what would you say if I was to go to a lake that I'd never ever fished in before, how would I get that, know exactly what fly to use? Um, Generally what I do if I go to a piece of water I've never fished before is I'll spend half an hour, 45 minutes just looking around to see what's on the water. See if I can see what bugs are available. Okay. Um, if I can't see anything, then uh, you go to your standbys, your, your dragonfly nymph patterns, fish that. Or, a, uh, or you could just troll a, a Spratly or a carry something like that until you get a fish and if you're going to kill it then you can maybe open it up and, and see what it's been feeding on or you can if you're going to release it you can use a sp stomach pump which is kind of a misnomer because you're not really checking what's in the stomach you're checking what's in the esophagus and uh, you can sample what's in there because that's what the fish has just finished feeding on it isn't digested yet so you can actually see what it is Is there any uh, time I should be having a fly on for before I change it, if it's not working, or what's your rule of thumb for changing um, your gear? I generally, I'm, I'm a chronomet I like fishing chronomets, so I'll always have a rod with a chronomet on it. And uh, it's just if I start noticing surface activity, fish start coming up in big slashing rises, then I'll change over to whatever insect it is that's emerging and fish that. But you can't really go wrong with a coronamid or, or a dragonfly nymph, something like that. I mean, the fish will take it. There are days when nothing will fly. Right. No, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you wouldn't leave the same fly on all day if nothing's biting, right? If nothing's biting, no. But, I mean, it's not so much changing the type of the of insect that you're trying to imitate as maybe so much as just the size or the color. Right, okay. The fish could be keying in on just a certain color or a certain size of insect. Okay. Um, at other times of year you could be fishing a scud pattern and not getting anything and the guy beside you is fishing a scud pattern but his scud pattern has a little orange, little orange ball in the center of the body. And it could be that the fish are actually king on the pregnant females. That orange ball is actually the marsupium or the egg pouch of the uh, freshwater shrimp or the, cut, the scut. So and at times fish get funny. They can just key on that one particular insect, that pregnant female, and leave all the rest of them alone. Uh, possibly because maybe they realize they're getting the most nutritional value for the amount of effort they're expending to get it. 
Uh, but I don't know myself. I've never gotten into the thinking of the trolleys. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. That's been very informative. Okay, thank you. No, I'm not talking, so you ain't gonna do much for me. You're gonna tell me here about this rod building stuff I there, Pete? Tell you nothing about rod building. Pete, right he's now. the best. Come on, Pete. <laughs> tell me about some rod building stuff here. What do you got in front of you? Well, right now we've got a couple of sturgeon rods. We got one that's um, on the laser with a few guides on it. That one's got another one here that I'm getting ready. To is that the one that's over here turning? That's the one that's there turning. Okay. Yeah. So we're just kind of getting set up. Okay. So what do I need to know to build a rod? Well, just put some eyes on it and tie it up myself? Yep, that's it. <laughs> you, um, you start over here on this side, you can you get your bare bones flank. comes just like that. That's all you get when you buy it. It's just a flank. Right. You've got to fit the cork onto the flank. Okay. So you fit them in the desired places for whatever your handle spacing is. You make a bushing out of tape right. that will accommodate your real seat. And you don't want it too tight, you don't want it too loose, just to take all the play out of it. And then you fit your upper handle cork over top. You want them tight, but you don't want them too tight because you want there to be enough glue there to actually do what glue is supposed to do and hold things on. Okay. So then after you get everything fitted, you um, actually glue in between the different layers of cork. You right. glue them one at a time. Yeah. Layer glue on each one. You fill these openings here with glue. Get the seat on there so that it fits with glue underneath it. Wipe off any excess. Push it on there. Fill up the little void that's in the end here. And you do the same thing. You just add glue in between all the layers of cork. And eventually you'll get it all glued up. And then you clamp it, and the clamp presses in between them all and brings them all tight. And then at the end of it, that's one that's all glued up. You can see the layers of glue where it's been forced out in between them. And then you have to put it on a lathe, and the lathe spins it, and you turn it just like woodworking until you get a nice smooth handle. And whatever contour you like. Looks pretty nice. So you can put them to your own shape of your hands then, eh, Pete? Yep. yep, you can make the handle whatever length you want, whatever thickness, whatever shape. So there was, it looks like there's quite a few stages to build in a rod. There is. There's a lot of different stages. At this stage here, you've just put the guides on in the proper placements. Okay. There's spec sheets and that that tell you the guide spacing. Just hold them roughly in place with tape. And then you actually secure them all in place with, with thread. Okay. And they're all held in place. You can put whatever decorative trim you want on it. You can write your name on the side here, do whatever custom work you want. Mm, so you can even put your name on it. That's right. That's a good idea. So nobody could ever claim your rod. Well, Is a custom made a lot stronger than a, just a regular store bought in them? Or uh, they're the same, Pete? Usually without fail. The corks are way more durable. The handle's more durable because it's glued on ring by ring. There's glue holding every piece of cork onto the flank. Factory-made handles are pre-manufactured and they, they have a, a center to them. Okay. You ream out the center to fit your blank and then try and get glue inside as best you can and it doesn't do nearly as good a job as if they're all clamped in separately. So you're really getting a good quality then? Yeah. And you know, you're getting something that's very personal. After you've got the thread on, it's covered with an epoxy coating. This is just bare thread. Mm -hmm. And then this one here has the epoxy coating on, which is super durable. It's going to last for, you know, a decade or more, unless you chip and crack it or something. So I take it if you break a personal rod, it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. And just because they're, uh, just because you've got an expensive rod doesn't mean that they can't break. Wow.
that's not through any fault of the rod. It's um, just a matter of the rod was put more put, put through more of a test than the rod was made to uh, handle. When you get something like that, can you repair that, Pete? Or? That would be totally unrepairable. Okay, so there is a limit as to what you can repair. Yeah. Any damage done near the ferrule joint where the two, the top and bottom half of the joint, uh -huh. pretty much unrepairable. They'll never be the same. If you get a break way down in the lower part of the rod, you can fix that, but right. generally speaking, this is a no-win situation okay. here. Got ya. That's about it in a nutshell. Well, it's been very informative, Pete. I've learned quite a bit about rod building this morning. Perfect. That's right. good. That's Thanks, what Pete. We're here for. Yeah. So Morning. So what do we got at this booth? Well, this booth here is a little program I started approximately three years ago. I saw a need for um, uh, a cleanup, an ongoing cleanup on the Chilliwack better system. Um, what I did was uh, I approached a few um, organizations and decided that um, I could use money to help me get this up and running, this program. And what it involves is three days per week, I go on to the uh, Chilliwack Better system, and I pick up all the major dump sites where people just bring their garbage down to the river and dump it into the, uh, onto the side banks. And, and uh, basically, I get the stolen cars and mattresses and furniture and appliances, and I get the whole gamut. Um, it's quite a bad problem we have here that uh, people don't understand that this is not their place to dump garbage. Uh, this, uh, for, for five dollars, you can go up to the baby landfill and you can dump your garbage up to 75 kilograms for four dollars. Uh, I do this uh, three days per week, six hours per day for those three days per week, and uh, basically that's what my program entails. Now, what's happened is fisheries renewal is no longer, um, no longer again. There is no more fisheries renewal, and I've been in front of council to ask for some uh, money to help this keep going, and they flatly refused. They said whatever. Oh yeah. It's down at the river and garbage is on the river, they will pick it up. Well, it lasted approximately a month, and this within the last week I've taken over 800 pounds, again, up to the garbage. So you're getting about 800 pounds a week uh, just yeah, on the rivers? sometimes more, yeah. So, and, um, so that's why they're getting a, sort of like a river watch and adopt the river program, is that right? Right, basically so what it is. I have a community watch program um, in the arrow because I know a lot of people that walk their dogs and they bike and they, they just fish, and what they do is when they spy garbage, they call me and I'm down there to get it the day, same day or the next day for the simple reason is that if we leave it there for more than a couple of days, other people think this is where they pile their garbage up. Right. And it just turns into even a bigger problem. Right. Uh, putting receptacles in does not work because this is what they figure this is where they dump their garbage again. Right. So basically at the end of this month, this program is going to be no longer unless I can find some kind of fun that's up. Right. Yeah, it's important. We all say that it's important to haul our garbage away when yeah. we're fishing, and and that's part of one of the code of conduct there. Exactly. Right? You, pack you bring it in, you take it out. Right. And the other side is do a little bit more and take take on a little bit more. Take an extra bag with you. And if you see um, garbage like Tim Hortons and McDonald's is one of the worst polluters. Uh, I won't say they're the worst, but the fishermen do leave their coffee cups down there. But uh, I wrote a letter to Tim Hortons, and they say that they uh, they have little sayings on their cups that says, do not litter. Well, it's not working. Right. What happens is when high water comes, these don't break down and they will cover up the reds, uh, preventing the fish from emerging from their, uh, from the gravel. Right. So, I mean, at the same time... So it destroys fish habitat. That's what's basically happening. what's happening. This is what's happening. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been very informative and, and we all know what's important to take your garbage out. Well, thanks for letting me uh, tell you about my program. And I notice you got